<laughs> All right, men, let's just, come on, let's just praise God. Come on, let's everybody stand up and just clap and give some celebration to God. He's worthy of the praise. Yeah, bless the Lord. It's good for men to praise the name of the Most High God. And we're going to have to do a lot of this while I'm speaking because they gave me the assignment of speaking to you right after lunch. Oh, man. And I don't know about y'all, but most of us, we want to find a couch or something, take a nap, right? So we're going to do a lot of call and response. We're going to do a lot of shouting out to God, right? Amen. You can be seated, man. I want to give a shameless shout out to the men of New Community Bible Fellowship. I can't help myself. I love my brothers. God bless you, man. Welcome. 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 I want to mention to you that at the resource table, there's some information concerning our ministry that you may want to stop by there and check out. And we really want to thank God for WCRF. We want to thank God for Mark and Dick Lee and everybody. Just to thank the Lord. WCRF is so critical to this Northeast Ohio region as far as keeping us strong as people of God, and we really thank the Lord for them. And you know, I'm going to tell you, man, I don't know about you, but this was a challenging week for me, and I heard someone else say it earlier. And the fact of the matter is that when the, when, when the Lord is about to do something great, and I believe God is doing something great here today, the enemy comes at us very strong. And I mean, the enemy really came at me strong, and it was just a very stressful, very challenging week. But I see God working, and I thank the Lord, so we're going to celebrate him, and we're going to continue to go forward. Northeast Ohio men, I am one of you. I'm your homie, okay? I'm your homie today. And I know something about Northeast Ohio men. I know we have to be strong men. We have to be strong men to walk with God and do the things that God wants us to do. Just the weather alone is a challenge, isn't it? Come on now, being a man of God and striving just to get up every day, be faithful to take care of our wife, take care of our children, take care of our business, want to get out and go through the snow and all that type of stuff, it's, it's hard. Northeast Ohio men have challenges of being strong men of God just because of our sports teams. Come on now. I just want to confess to you, I've got this little prayer that I pray. I didn't learn in seminary, didn't learn in the Bible study. I don't even know if it's biblical. You know, we're waiting for the return of Jesus, but I have this little prayer. Lord, I pray for the return of a championship, please. And I'm not picky. It can be basketball, it can be football, it can be baseball, but Lord, please come, Lord Jesus, come. We have to be strong. And so I'm with you today as a fellow warrior, as a brother in Christ. I'm receiving and I'm learning today as well. I've been so blessed to sit under Dr. Nyquist and his word. Wasn't that a wonderful word? We thank God for that. Charity, grace. I've been blessed, uh, as I said, under Pastor Job and just the whole issue of coming out of our cave. And I know so many of you were as well. But here's what I know. I know that we're here and I know that we want to be good men. We're men who want to live for God, who want to honor God and do right by our family, our wives and our kids. But here's what else I know. I know that many of us as men, we are struggling. Many of us as men, we haven't worked in a while and we want to work. We try to find work, but it hasn't worked out. Many of us as men are under incredible financial pressure. Some of us as men, we're under incredible emotional pressure. We're managing emotional pain each and every day. We're managing stress. Some of us as men are struggling with depression. Some of us men have some anger issues that we're dealing through. And I I know we're dealing with all these various issues. Many of us men who are going through various things, intense temptations and things of that nature. And when it comes to that, all we're trying to do here is say is that God is with us even though we may be going through some very difficult things. And when it comes to that, we have to understand that we're all in the same boat. I want you to say this with me. Say, no temptation has hit you except that which also has hit me. See, we're all in the same boat. We're trying to struggle through as men, and we're trying to be strong and do the things that God wants us to do. And I know that I am as a man of God, and I thank God for the victory. I thank God for what he's done in my life. But every day I wake up and I ask for his grace, and I ask for his mercy and strength to continue to honor him with my life. Every day I face intense responsibilities that weigh on my soul. Every day I face trials and difficulties. I'm dealing with money challenges just like you are. I deal with marriage challenges just like you do. So we're brothers together here today, right? We're learning together. And here's my word to you. As weak and as inadequate as we may feel, God says he will be our strength. And God says he will train our arms for victory. 
And so understand, man, sometimes you may feel like, man, it was a mistake, God, that you called me. It's a mistake that I'm even here. But understand that God sees you, God knows you, and God did not make a mistake. My Bible says that God can take those who are weak to shame those things that are strong. And he can take those things that are foolish to shame those things that the world call wise. So even though we're weak, he's strong in us and through us. I want you to say this with me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Isn't it good to know that God says at the end of the day, it's not based on me. God says, I'm working through you in my power. I'm working in you. And no matter what your background no matter what your past. See, there may be some men who are just really ready to give up. You may have been, even had suicidal thoughts. You may have thought about just walking out on your family. Pastor Job talked about that. Just, just saying, I'm, forget it all. I'm just leaving it all. I'm going to start over. Understand that God says he's with you and he can see you through this, through his power, his mercy, his victory. No matter what we've gone through, he can pick us up. He can restore us. He can give us hope where we're about to give up. So God says, I got you. I got you. My message to you today, I want to declare to you, is that you are a son of Abraham. I want you to say that with me. I am, I am a, son a son of Abraham. Now, trust me on this. When my call and response, you say, he's asking me to say things I'm not sure about. Trust me, I'm not going to lead you wrong, okay? I'm not going to have you say anything like Buddha is Lord or anything like that, okay? So say, I am, I am a, son a son of Abraham. In case you think I'm making it up, over in Galatians chapter 3, Paul talks about this. In verses 6 and 7 in the book of Galatians, he says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith, that's us men, who are the sons of Abraham. Abraham put his faith in God. It was credited to him as righteousness. And when we do the same thing, God says we are sons of Abraham. Look what he goes on to say in verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. We're going to look at that in a second. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham is the father of our faith. When God called Abraham, he called Abraham to a life of faith. He called him out to go to a place that he, he wasn't even sure where he was going. It was all a set up to build him up in faith. And when God calls us to himself as men of God, we are also called into a faith journey. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive the same spiritual heritage as Abraham does. He received it looking forward. We receive it looking back at it. But it's the same heritage. And so what God did with Abraham in establishing the faith through Abraham, he established a covenant. He established a covenant with Abraham. And that takes us over to Genesis chapter 12. I want you to turn over there. And just like Abraham, we ought to be in covenant with God as Christian men. You, man of God, are on a divine mandate. Maybe you're here today and you haven't given your life to God, but God is speaking to you. God is calling you. You know how I know that? You're at an all-day men's conference. It's not an accident. It's not coincidence. God is calling you to himself. And we hope and pray that before this conference is over, if you haven't done so already, you will give your life to Jesus Christ. But understand, as a Christian man, we are on a divine mandate on a mission from God. And so we're going to look at the life of Abraham here. And over in chapter 12, we're introduced to this Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is pregnant. This covenantal promise from God is, is pregnant. In fact, there are at least seven clear declarations that God gives to Abraham. And because we are the sons of Abraham, we are in the same faith. To some degree, they apply to us as well. Seven declarations. Let me give them to you very quickly. This is all a setup. This is all background so we can get to where we want to go. First of all, he promised to prosper Abraham. He said, I will make you a great nation. Secondly, he promised to pamper Abraham. He said, I will bless you. Thirdly, he promised to give Abram prominence. He said, I will make your name great. Fourthly, he promised to make Abram a provider. He said, you will be a blessing. Not only will I bless you with enough, but with more than enough so you can bless others, Abraham. Also, fifthly, he promised to give Abram power. He said, I will bless those who bless you. 
And then he promised sixthly to protect Abram, I will curse those who curse you. And then lastly, the seventh, he promised to give Abram the privilege of producing the Prince of Peace. How's that for a preacher? All those peace. And in, in that he says, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And men, these same promises carry over to us as men as we walk by faith in Jesus Christ. Let me just go over them with you again and show them how they apply to you in Christ Jesus. First of all, God, God has promised to prosper us. He's given us eternal life and all riches in Christ Jesus. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Secondly, God has promised to pamper us. Through Christ, he has given us exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or imagine. Next, God has promised to give us prominence. He says in Philippians chapter 1 that he who has begun a good work in you, he's able to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Next, God has promised to make us providers. He says in John 15, as we abide in him and he in us, we will bear not only fruit, but we will bear much fruit. Next, he promised to give us power. It says that now, because we are in Christ Jesus, we are more than conquerors. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Next, he promised to protect us. He says he will always give us the victory in Christ Jesus. He fights our battles for us. Isn't that good news? He promised to give us the privilege of being ambassadors for Christ. Now, we are the light of the world. We are the salt to the earth. We are able to go and testify through our lives and through our words of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we are the sons of Abraham. Our lives have great potential and purpose just like Abraham's. And we begin to see this played out over in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham has been called out. He's on his journey. He's on his venture. But there are three things that come out of Genesis chapter 14 where Abraham has to rescue his nephew Lot. Lot has been taken captive. And the three things we're going to see about us as men that are true of Abraham and that's true of us as well is that Abraham was a warrior, Abraham was a builder, and Abraham was a worshiper. First, warrior. A key part of our faith as men is to be warriors. What do we mean by warriors? We mean fighting to preserve the righteousness of God. First and foremost in our lives, also in our families' lives, and as much as we can in the broader society and community. In Genesis 14, we find Abraham, he's in rare form having to rescue his nephew Lot. He's, he's a warrior. And many of you know the backstory that Lot and Abraham had separated because there was, there was fighting between their herdsmen because there wasn't enough room on the land that they were sharing together. And so Abraham told Lot, hey, listen, you're my nephew. I'm your uncle. We ought not be fighting like this. So listen, you look and you find some land in one direction. I'll go in the other direction. I'll even give you first choice. And many of us know the story that Lot looked and he saw Sodom. He didn't look at the quality of the people. He looked at the beauty of the land. We have to be careful how we make decisions. And he decided to go into Sodom. Little did Lot know that Sodom was in bondage to another nation, another group of nations, actually. And Sodom really represents bondage all along the way. And so when he went into this land, they had been in bondage for 12 years to another nation. And at this point, when Lot came into Sodom, Sodom and the other alliance of nations that they were with had decided enough is enough. We've been in bondage to these other nations. We're going to revolt. We're going to rise up. We're going to resist. We're going to fight them back. And a big battle took place between this one alliance of nations and this other alliance of nations that Sodom was a part of. And in the process, the king of the other nation invaded Sodom and they took Lot, his family, and a whole lot of other people from Sodom. And so Abraham gets the news. Somebody escapes who's been there in Sodom going through all this. And Abraham gets the news that Lot has been taken captive. And that is where the reading begins in verse 14 of Genesis 14. Look at this. It says, now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, his brother, that means his same blood, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan. I love this. This is Abraham, y'all. This is cautious, conservative Abraham. This is the guy who had told his wife just the other chapter to lie to the king and tell him that you're really my sister so that I won't get killed. Now all of a sudden he's taking up this Rambo type mindset and he's going into war. Look at some of the things that the verse says here. It says that he armed, that means he has military weapons. It says that these servants that he had there who had been brought up in his home, they were trained. That means they had advanced training. They were battle ready. And then it says they went in pursuit of the enemy. I love this. Look at verse 15. 
It says he divided the forces. That's tactical, strategic, warrior type strategies. He divided the forces to make his army seem bigger than what they were. And then it says that they attacked, and they attacked from different sides, and they attacked at night. All of these are war tactics and war strategies. This is Abraham. This is Abraham, the man who is basically a shepherd, a man who's a traveler. But here's what we learn from Abraham. There are certain things as a man, when they happen to you, they're worth fighting for. And it's true of us as men, there are certain things that we have to be ready to fight for. And so verse 16, so it says, he brought back, mission accomplished, all the goods, and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. He raided the enemy, he rescued not only Lot, but all the people who had been taken by this alliance of enemy nations. Men, understand that a part of your manhood is the fact that we have been called to be warriors. Now, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against things that are seen. In fact, it would be easier if that was all we were wrestling against. We know how to, we know how to do warfare in the natural, but this is a supernatural thing that's going on. And what we are battling for is to preserve the righteousness of God in our lives and our families. This is why Paul said at the end of his life, he said, listen, I have fought a good fight. Now, Paul said, I'm fight. I fought a fight. It was a good fight, but it was a fight all the same. He understood that there was a battle that was going on. And if you and if, you, and if I are striving to be a man of God, there is a constant attack on us because the enemy is trying to destroy the kingdom of God. See, it's really not about you. It's really not about me. It's really about the kingdom of God. The enemy launched his first attack when he attacked Adam and Eve in the garden. And he didn't just attack them, but he attacked family. He attacked men. He attacked women. And sometimes we as men, we don't see the intensity of the warfare that's going on. So here's how you know that you're in a war. When there is a constant threat and there's imminent attack. And did you know there's a constant threat from the enemy and there's imminent attack? There's unavoidable attack. Sooner or later, the enemy will attack. This is what Peter says when he says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, he's prowling around like a roaring lion and he's looking for someone to devour. How do we fight this fight? We have to pony up as men. We have to man up as men and every day get into the presence of God and spend time with him and ask him for strength and power that we need to fight that good fight of faith. What is being a warrior for the sake of God's kingdom like? First of all, a warrior is decisive. A warrior has to make strong decisions and stick with them even when it's unpopular. Sometimes you have to tell your children, you know what? You cannot hang out with that guy. You cannot hang out with that young lady because you've seen that they are into things that you don't want your child into. And so you have to protect them and you have to be able to handle it when your kids are upset with you. You have to be able to handle it when they're pouting or they don't want to give you a hug and all those type of things. Anybody ever been through that? Making those strong decisions. A warrior is a protector. Sometimes we as men, we don't protect our children. We don't pay attention to what they're watching and what they're chatting with and who they're chatting with in the cyber world. And that's a way that the enemy can get into our kids. And a warrior is a protector. And so we have to check. We have to check phones and things like that. And we've been through that in my home. And I'm going to tell you, there's been a time in my life where I had to apologize to my kids. Because it wasn't them, it was me. I remember it was a number of years ago, and now um, my two daughters are off in college. But there was this movie that came out. And if I told you what the movie was, you would know what it was, but I'm not going to say what it was. And, and it was PG-13. They were about 11 and 9. And uh, every, all the kids were going to see it. It was a, really a family movie. And we took them to see this movie. And then I began to listen to some of the things that were being said. I began to do some research. And there was a lot of talk in the Christian, in the Christian community about this movie at this point. And come to find out that they were using real witches chants. And so I went to my daughters. I said, girl, daddy needs to apologize to you and ask you to forgive me. I dropped the ball on that. There are some things that's going on in that movie that I don't think is good for you, that, that your spirit doesn't need to be exposed to. And we prayed together and we talked about it. You know what the amazing thing was? They went with me on it. I told them, listen, where, wherever we create a void, we're going to also put something in it. So we're going to make sure we still have things to do. But as those other series from that movie come out, we cannot go see those. Now they've gone off to college. They may have snuck off and seen them by now. I don't know. You do what you can do, right? When you can do it, right? But a warrior is a protector. How do we wage war? We wage war through the word and through prayer. The weapons of our warfare are not of this world. We wage war by getting in the word of God and studying. 
studying with our families, studying on our own, studying with other men. My, one of my challenges to us as men today is to make sure you are in a small group Bible study. It's important for us to pull our family together and spend time in the Word, even if you're not good at it. That's okay. Just get some type of tool, a book, a study book, a simple story, and read through it and talk. The best way to teach your children the Word is through teachable moments. And so understand, God wants us to wage war by being in the Word and prayer. How do we wage war? Another way we wage war is through communication. It's very important for us as men to be communicators. And many of us men, we're losing the battle when it comes to communicating. Many of us men, we don't like to communicate. That's what Pastor was talking about earlier, how we go into this cave. But as good leaders, if you're going to be a good leader, you have to be a communicator. In fact, you cannot lead if you cannot communicate. So many of us are losing the battle on this front. We don't like a lot of communication because communication is hard when we have to talk to other people and work through issues, when we have to have those deep tissue conversations with our children, when we have to talk through stuff with our wives. And wives like to talk deep, don't they? I mean, man, they just, it's like it's endless, man. I mean... And we'd rather just check out and go watch Sports Center or ESPN, <laughs> the news or our favorite TV show. God showed me very early in my marriage that when I come home, it's time for me to spend time with my wife. I have to be able to, to really intentionally spend time with her. I'm an introvert. I really don't like talking that much, and especially when I'm tired. But I have to intentionally create pockets of opportunity in my home to talk with my, my, my wife. I have to proactively create moments to have communication, whether we're in the kitchen, whether we're in the bedroom, whether we're in the restroom, and I'm shaving, and she's doing her makeup. All of these are opportunities. So I always try to be at the same place where my wife is. One of the things that we decided early in our marriage is that we would not have a television in our bedroom. Because the bedroom to us is very sacred. We wanted to make sure that we weren't super distracted and we were able to spend time talking. And, and I just wanted to be available for my wife. You say, that created a lot more work for you, didn't it? Yes, it did. <laughs> Pray for me. And then I found out that women on any given day speak 50,000 words. And men on any given day speak 25,000 words. Man, I'm done by the time I get home. <laughs> I'm probably done by 11 o'clock, actually. But we did that. We, 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 put, we put that in place in our bedroom so that we could have more time to talk. And we've been honoring that. But lately, here's what happened. I got an iPad, maybe a year or so ago. I love my iPad. It has revolutionized my life. I mean, everything's on my iPad. All my music, my news, my calendar, uh, my photos, uh, videos, favorite TV program. I just put everything on my iPad. And I found out that now, as we were in the bedchamber, even though we didn't have a television, I was spending so much time with my iPad, we might as well have. And so God began to show me that, that I have to fight to make sure I preserve that time. And so now I don't take my iPad to the bedroom with me. At least if my wife is there, I don't. <laughs> warrior, say, I am a son of Abraham. I am a warrior. The next thing we see is builder. And that means not only fighting to preserve righteousness, but training others in order to rep reproduce righteousness. God has called us as men. One of our purposes is to reproduce, to reproduce the righteousness of God in others, to develop people, to build people, to influence others. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. He says, therefore, go and make that's an action word, make. We men like making. Make disciples. Paul talks about it in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, the things that I have given to you in the presence of many men, you pass on to others who will also teach others as well. Building, discipling, developing, influencing, reproducing. Again, in verse 14, notice what he says here. He says that he armed his 318 trained servants. They were born in his own house. This is really a beautiful thing. First of all, these are servants that were born in Abraham's house. He didn't have to train them with such special skills. But, you know, a true leader is always a servant, always looking out for the best interest of the other person. So as a result of that, Abraham trains these 318 servants on how to be warriors. He trains them up. He takes the time to build them and develop them. 
And the point I'm trying to make is that God has called us as men in our sphere of influence, the people we are around, to make sure that we're doing what we can as God gives us opportunities to build and develop people. This is why it's so important for me as a man of God to take advantage of every opportunity I can to be able to influence someone. People should be better because they've had an encounter with us as men, whether it's for 30 minutes or whether it's for 30 years. When we lead people, they should be encouraged. When we lead people, they should be stronger. When kingdom men lead people, they should be better. By our sheer presence in their lives, our influence is being made in their lives. And I like this because Abraham built the people in his house. Oh, that's good. You know, it's harder to build the people in your house. It's sometimes easier to make disciples outside your house. I I love making disciples. I love helping men, and I love seeing men come to Jesus and then going through that whole process from A to whatever, seeing them grow up into strong men of God. But my most important disciple in my life is my wife. And my most important disciples in my life are my children. And I don't say that in a condescending way about my wife because my wife sharpens me just as much as I sharpen her. She's a sharp sister, and she loves the Lord. But the point I'm trying to make is that God gives me a responsibility. I'm supposed to, Ephesians 5, present her blameless in the presence of the Lord. I have a responsibility to make sure she's developed, that she's growing the Lord, that she stays healthy. And so in the course of helping many others, I cannot neglect my first order of ministry, my home. I have to be a builder in my own home. This is true of my children. Uh, Building up our children in every way, having the time to build our children is so important, men. To pour the word into them. When they're very small, get a little children's Bible and read Bible stories to them at night. As they get older, begin to pour the word into them and find things that relate to them. I remember when our kids were maybe three and four years old and we were having devotion around the dinner table. And I'm going to tell you, there was a lot of spaghetti thrown and not a lot of word, actually. But we found fun ways to get as much word as we could in the midst of the chaos of small children. We have to build our children. I remember even, in the, even beyond spiritual things, we have to build our children. I remember uh, one of my daughters was really struggling as, in high school. And she was in high school or junior high. And she could just not get this subject down. And man, I was really upset. I was getting a little attitude. I was resentful because we were sending her to a private school. And I'm thinking, man, we're sending her to a private school, man. They need to be able to, and she's gone to a tutor and all this type of stuff. And I'm saying, you know what, we're paying this money. They should be able to help this girl and what's going on. And God just kind of whispered in my ear one day, Kevin, it is your responsibility to train your children. And don't think because you're paying, whether it's public or private, is your responsibility. And God began to show me a plan. I'm not the smartest guy in the world either, and the subjects that she was not doing well in were not good subjects for me. But I kid you not, we went through a season like three hours almost every weekday night of sitting down where, man, it was hard, man. It was like, just stick me in my eye with a toothpick. You know, I mean, it was, it was hard. Because we weren't only learning the material, but I found out that we were learning how to study. Oh, you finished the assignment, why didn't you turn it in? I don't know. We're dealing with a lot of character issues, and I'm going to tell you, my daughter just went off to college, and part of what she went off was an academic scholarship. That's God. And God tells us we are to build up our family, and it takes time. It takes time. My only regret is that I didn't spend more time. I look at my children sometimes, and I say they could maybe be a little bit stronger in this area or that area if I'd have invested more time. It's harder to build in your home. Now, I'm in, let me tell you, I've been married for 25 years, and God has blessed us to build a great marriage. I'm very thankful for my wife. She loves me. I love her. She still lets me come home. She doesn't change the key on the lock and all that type of stuff. 25 years of marriage. I've preached on marriage. I've done conferences on marriage. We've done marriage counseling. I've married people, all this type of stuff. And I've concluded some very simple truths about what all I've learned about marriage, and it boils down to three words. Marriage is hard. <laughs> marriage is hard and you have to stick in there with it and continue to say I love my wife and I'm going to help her to grow where it's appropriate I'm going to allow her to help me to grow I'm going to maintain a spirit of humility and gentleness as I walk with my wife and love her and nurture her in her character and nurture her in the faith now for our 25 year anniversary which was last April we were blessed to go to Hawaii 
And man, that was a miracle even in of itself. You know what I'm saying? Because Lord knows we didn't have the money, but God worked it out. And here we are over in, over in Hawaii, 25 year anniversary, just having a great time. And I said, babe, while we're here, I don't want us to just do the nice, simple stuff, you know, where we walk down the beach and we go out to eat. I want us to have an adventure. I want us to do something that's really adventure. You know, the older you get, the more you want to stay active to try and prove to people that you can still have adventures, right? <laughs> And so we did our research and we decided to do what they call biking the volcano. Have you ever heard of that? Biking the volcano. It's where they literally take you up some 10,000 feet up a volcano and then you get on these bikes and you ride them down. I mean, I kid you not, we were up so high that we were looking down on clouds. And, and, and it, was a, it was an amazing thing. I mean, once you start down, and understand this is an inactive volcano, okay? All right, I just, I don't want to over-dramatize it, you know. I'm not Harrison Ford, okay? The roads were paved, all right? Because I can see y'all going to leave here and you're going to Google it and say, hey, wait a minute. It was still challenging. Man, we're going 25 miles an hour down the volcano. It takes about three, maybe even four hours to get down. We've got a guide on our way up the, up the volcano. We're in this like 15 passenger van and the guide, you got the driver and you got the guide sitting next to him. The, the guide is a guy who's a native to Hawaii. He's playing a ukulele or a ukulele, he corrected me. And he's playing these nice little love songs and he'll stop in between songs and he'll say things like, now listen, understand, this is very dangerous. They've already had us assign all these waivers. He'll say things like, you could go over the handlebars, you could crash in the side of the rock, you know, you could hit a certain curve and there could be a car there and take you out. You could go over the cliff and all this type of stuff. <laughs> Here's how you do to stay safe here. Here's how you do to stay safe here. And then he'd go back to playing his ukulele. I felt like dude was, was slowly brainwashing us to make sure we were going to enjoy this. And so understand, we finally started down this hill and it's just exhilarating. It's hard. It's challenging. It's scary, but I ended up telling my wife, I said, babe, that was the best part of our time and I would love to do it again. Same thing with marriage. Exhilarating, hard, challenging, scary, but it is the most wonderful blessing of my life and of your life. So men, I say that to you to not give up. <laughs> Keep building your wife. We just had a situation where we had a Super Bowl party. That was another opportunity for me to make sure I was being an example because a key way in which we build up people is through our example. And by the way, Super Bowl party, how did y'all do with the halftime show? Huh? That'd be a good subject, wouldn't it, for uh, our men's Bible study groups? Come on, don't get quiet on me. <laughs> I've been kind of surveying, polling brothers about that. Brothers handled that in different ways. Christian men, Christian men of God. Some brothers use the makeup excuse. Hey, baby, isn't that the type of makeup you've been wanting? Let me watch this with you. <laughs> Some brothers use the, the research excuse. Our church is going to be putting on a production. I got to see how that fire come out of stage, how those lights. <laughs> Some brothers just had a prayer service during the halftime. Man, that must have been frustrating being at that house. <laughs> me... I couldn't handle it. You know, y'all may be more golly than me, but I couldn't handle it. I watched a few seconds. I had to get up, and I used the phone excuse. I, I got up, and I said, there's somebody I can call. So I just walked away from the TV, calling somebody, you know. Hey, what's going on, man? You watching the halftime show? A dude said to me, man, what kind of American are you calling me during the Super Bowl halftime show? I ain't never coming back to your church. So we, we, we're going to put on this Super Bowl party. Five days before the party, my wife comes to me and she says, hey, you know what, honey? I'm excited. We got the people all in place. The people are coming out. I don't think our tele television is big enough. Do you think we need to get a bigger TV? I'm like, is this a trick question? <laughs> what man doesn't want a bigger TV? Now, we had a nice big screen TV, but she wanted to go 60 inch. And man, I, I, I was ready to go, and then God just kind of tugged at my spirit. It felt like Adam and Eve was handing me the apple, man. <laughs> I didn't tell her that, and don't none of y'all tell her that either, okay? God reminded me that we were on a budget, we had some financial goals, and this was 
impulsive and that we shouldn't do it. And so on the inside, I was saying, yes, 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 yes. But on the outside, I said, babe, we can't do that. If we're going to build up people, we have to be an example to them as to how we live. By the way, man, you've not loved your wife as Christ loved the church until you suffer for the messes that she's made. You really haven't. You have not loved your wife. Think about it. As Christ loved the church until you are willing to suffer for the mess. I run into men all the time. They'll say, man, that's her debt. That's her mess, man. She got to fix that up by herself. No, we become one flesh with our wives. And understand the whole issue of, of being a husband to a wife is just like Christ became our savior. You become a savior to her. In most epic movies and in mo most epic battles and novels, the heroes die in order to save somebody. They die in order to make sure the village is going to be okay. Let me break it down to you real simple. Obi-Wan Kenobi died so that Luke could be stronger, okay? <laughs> Jesus didn't die for the things we did right. He died for what we did wrong. And see, that's for somebody right there because we'll really think, hey, it's a 50-50 thing with me and my wife. Building people up means helping them to come out. One of the things that, that Abraham did is he went and he rescued Lot. Isn't that a beautiful thing? See, Lot had disrespected Abraham. Abraham could have easily said, hey, Lot got himself in that mess. I'm not going to get him. But he went after him. And there's some men here where you've got a situation with a son, a situation with a daughter. And God is telling you not to give up on them. They disrespected you. They said they wanted to have nothing else to do with you. Go after them anyway. As a man, I realize that now I have grown into the Abraham. I'm no longer the lot. I am the guy who's supposed to be blessing. I'm the guy who's supposed to be showing grace and mercy to others. I'm the guy who's supposed to be showing that kindness and helping the next men who are coming up. And so we have to have this thing that we're going to go after them. And men, if there's somebody in your life who is caught in something and has really hurt you, don't give up on them. You go after them. You may not be able to go after them directly, but find a way to stay connected with them. Let them know you love them. The prodigal son's dad never gave up on him. Amen. And don't you give up. And then I want to speak to men who may be caught in something because the whole backdrop to this whole issue with Lot is that there was sexual bondage. Lot was caught in sexual bondage. Understand that Lot, the Bible says in Peter, that he was tormented in his soul because he was living in Sodom. Lot was so mixed up that he was willing to give his daughter over to men that they could use them sexually. Even though Lot never got involved in sexual bondage himself, that shows how messed up he was. And there are some men who, who may be caught in sexual bondage. And God says, listen, I love you and you can come out of that. God says, I am able to deliver you from that. God says, I can change your life. God has ordained sex between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. Can I say that again? Because sexual bondage is a major bondage issue in our society, and God has ordained sex between a man and a woman. I better say one man and one woman in the context of marriage. It's not sex between a married man and a single woman. It's not sex between a married man with a woman married to somebody else. It's not sex between a single man and a single woman. Not sex between a man and an image on a computer screen or in a magazine. Not sex between a man and a man. Not sex between a man and a child. Did I, did I cover everything? See, you have to be specific today, don't you? But understand that God says he loves you. And understand, God loves sex. God's the one who created it. The pornography market did not create sex. Hollywood did not create sex. God created sex, and when he se created sex, just like with everything else, he said it's good. But in a certain context, God loves you. You may be a man here, you've been struggling in sexual bondage, and God is calling you out. And I want us to take a moment right now. I want us to take a moment right now and just call that out. I'm not calling you up. But I'm saying if you are struggling, you're in a situation, it may be with a woman, it may be with some other situation, God says he loves you and he can deliver you. Now let me tell you, I'm not speaking theoretically. I was in sexual bondage. 
And when I got saved, God had to deliver me. So I'm not speaking to you as some professor. I've seen God, what God, and if God can do it to me, as messed up as I am, and y'all, y'all listen, I've been married for 25 years, and even before then, he had delivered me. He can do it for you, because I'm a very weak man. But in him, I can be strong if I, if, as I stay close to him. Men, I really do want to deal with this right now. I want us to deal with this right now in the name of Jesus. I want us to bow our heads. And I want to say to the men who are struggling with some type of sexual addiction, some type of sexual struggle, I want to say to you that I want to pray over you. I want those other men who are in this room who are living in a right situation where you're not struggling. You don't have to be perfect. The Bible says that the prayers of a righteous man uh, accomplishes much. It doesn't mean a person who's perfect, but a person who's right with God. I want you to join me in prayer. And I just want us to pray this, and we want to pray this together. I want you to pray this along with me. Say, we declare in the name of Jesus for all men under the covering of this prayer who may be in sexual bondage that they can be set free. And we ask through the power of Jesus that you would set them free. For he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Now give God some praise, men, in the name of Jesus. Warriors, builders, very quickly, lastly, worshipers. And this is where we surrender to receive righteousness. In verse 18, in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham's returning from the battle. It says that the king of Salem, Melchizedek, comes out to greet him and to celebrate him. And in verse 19, it says that Melchizedek blessed and said to Abraham, Blessed be Abram of God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And it says that Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. Now you have to understand that this was an opportunity for Abraham to really gloat, to be focused on himself. And you have to understand, instead of that, Abraham brought a tithe. He wanted to do something to show his love for God. Melchizedek is a real king of that time, but he also represents an eternal priesthood that Jesus Christ rules over. When, Melchiz- when, when Abraham gave the tithe to Melchizedek, he actually gave it to Jesus Christ himself. If you don't believe me, read Hebrews chapter 7 and you'll see it's true. But the point we're trying to make here is that where everybody was running out to celebrate him, he was trying to celebrate God. He could have really been smelling himself at this point. I defeated Sodom. I came up with this brilliant strategy. I took down the enemy. Instead, he does something that says, my God is worthy of worship. My God gave me the victory. Giving a tithe, giving an offering to the Lord was a form of surrender. We've been hearing that word a lot today, haven't we? It was a form of worship, a form of acknowledging that, God, I trust you and not money. I trust you and not myself. I trust you and not people. I trust you and not things. It's acknowledging God's absolute greatness and our absolute dependence. There is so much at stake, men, when we worship. And understand what's at stake. God wants to fight our battles against the enemy as we worship. As we worship, we express our dependence on God. As we worship, we express our surrender to God. As we worship, God pours power into people who worship him. And Lord knows that we as men need power. We need power. And could this be why there is no power amongst God's men today? Because we're not worshiping. We, we go to church, we go to our jobs, we come home to our families, we go to our kids' events, but there's no real power. It's through worship that God gives us that power because God gives grace to the humble. And giving is just the elementary starting point of worship because true worship always requires a sacrifice. But what God really wants is not our money, not our things. He wants our hearts. And that is true of Abraham. He said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. God never wanted Abraham's son. God wanted Abraham's heart. This is why Paul says that he desires that men would lift up holy hands, that means clean hands, in the church. He says without wrath, that means there's no anger, there's no, there's no unresolved conflict with other people. And then he says without doubting, that means that, that we are men of faith. 
He says, when men in the, in the body of Christ lift up our hands and worship to the Lord, whether he meant it symbolically or literally, that's not the point. But he says, when we're able to lift up our hands and they're clean and they're full of faith and there's no anger there, God moves in mighty ways. When men worship, when men worship the Lord, when men give of themselves to the Lord, when men surrender all they have to the Lord. And so we see that Abraham was always expressing praise and worship. In fact, men... He was always giving God praise. Uh, Even when God gave him that covenantal promise that, Abraham, I'm going to prosper you and pamper you and give you prominence and make you a provider, give you power, give you protection, and cause you to be the privileged person to bring forth Christ. Whenever God would remind him of that promise all throughout the book of Genesis, the Bible says that Abraham would build an altar. Now, building an altar represents the presence of God. So he would come into the presence of God. Men, when was the last time you really came into the presence of God? All by yourself. God calls us to be men who are willing to come into his presence. Let's bow together in prayer. God has called us as men to be warriors. And many of us may feel defeated by sin or defeated by failures and we want to give up. God says, you can come to me. God has called us to be builders, but we may feel like the things that we've touched in our lives, they've gotten worse and they haven't gotten better. God has called us to be worshipers where we surrender and he gives power, but we may feel like we're lacking power. And so, God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for us as men. And, Father, we're all in this foxhole together striving to fight the good fight of faith. And I pray that you would build up warriors, builders, and worshipers. Heads are still bowed, and I know my, hand, my time is up, but listen, heads are bowed. There may be a man here, or many men here, where you're a good man. There's no question about that. You would not be at a men's conference if you were not a good man. But God is calling you to true salvation, to truly give your life to Jesus Christ. And you've never done that. For whatever reason, you've never done that. You've never said, Jesus, you are my King and my Lord. I live for you and I die for you. You haven't expressed that faith in Jesus fully as Abraham did. And he died on the cross for your sins, and he loves you very much, man. And if that's you here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, now listen, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you just raise your hand if you want to give your life to Jesus today? Just raise your hand. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I see that hand. I see that one. I see that one way high over there. I see two, three over there. And some others are coming up. Pray this prayer with me, men, those who raise their hands. And there are others who wanted to raise their hands, but they did not. Say, Jesus, come into my life in a real way. I want to be a warrior, but I'm weak without you. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Say, I want to be a builder, but I can't do it without you. And then say, I surrender. Say, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Say that to him. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Say, I receive you now into my heart. Say that. Into my life. Say that. As my Lord and Savior. Say that. Men, and if you meant business, you don't have to come up to the front. God knows, but you need to tell somebody you came with or someone who you know who is a really serious and sincere Christian about this. Today, today, before you leave here and say, pray with me. There are men here who have given their lives to Christ, but you've been like the prodigal. You've been far from God and God is calling you back. And I want you to pray this. Say, Jesus, I want to rededicate myself to you today. And I give myself to you fully once again. Say, forgive me for straying. I'm coming home. Father God, again, we thank you for this time and we thank you for your presence. Continue to work in our lives to bring glory to yourself. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.